Hi, we have been talking about space-time symmetries. In the last class, we discussed space translation symmetry and conservation of linear momentum. Today, we shall discuss the time translation symmetry and the associated conservation law, which is the conservation of energy. We shall also discuss rotational symmetry and the associated conservation law, which is the conservation of angular momentum. Displacement in time, just like displacement in space, is a continuous transformation and therefore it has to be a unitary transformation because all transformations, all continuous transformations are also unitary transformations. In time translation, what we are doing is that if the system, the system at time t is simply being translated to a time t plus delta tau, all right, or the system at time t minus delta tau is being translated to a time T. So just as we discussed when we talked about translations, the wave function at t minus delta tau all right, has to be equal to the transformed wave function at time t because we are just shifting the system from this point to this point in time. So we can write psi prime of t, the transformed wave function at time t is equal to psi of t minus delta tau. If you are transforming the system or if you are translating the system in time, by an amount delta tau. This means that the same events that correspond to t minus delta tau in psi now correspond to time t in psi prime, all right? Because we are simply transforming, we are simply translating the system from this point of time to another point of time. So whatever events correspond to the wave function psi, the untransformed wave function at time t minus delta tau has to be the same as the events corresponding to the transformed wave function psi prime but at time t. Okay, I hope this is clear. Since time translation is a unitary transformation, we can associate a unitary operator to this transformation. So the effect of the displacement tau, if you are displacing the system by a time tau, all right, the effect of this displacement on the wave function psi of t can be written as the unitary operator corresponding to this transformation acting on psi of t. And the transformed wave function is psi prime of t, which we said has to be equal to psi of t minus tau. It has to be the untransformed wave function at time t minus tau. So this unitary operator has to be in such a way that the unitary transformation of psi of t gives psi of t minus tau. Okay. Let's now consider an infinitesimal displacement in time. That is, we consider a displacement in time by an amount delta tau where delta tau is an infinitesimal amount of time, all right? So as before, we must have psi prime of t is equal to psi of t minus delta tau. We can now expand this in a Taylor series expansion. Since delta tau is an infinitesimal amount of time, we shall retain only up to the first term in the Taylor series expansion. So we have psi prime of t is equal to psi of t minus delta tau, partial time derivative of psi, all right? Now we can write this as the identity operator minus delta tau partial time derivative and this whole thing acting on psi of t. The second term in the bracket here can be written by multiplying and dividing with ih bar. So this can be written as delta tau divided by ih bar, ih bar partial, der partial time derivative. All right. Now if you remember the Schrodinger equation, okay, we had it like this, ih bar partial derivative of psi is equal to h psi, right? This means that the action of ih bar partial time derivative and the Hamiltonian on the wave function is the same, which means that this ih bar partial derivative with respect to time is the Hamiltonian operator, right? So this thing can be written as h hat, the Hamiltonian operator, and the i in the denominator can take it to the numerator and becomes minus i. So we have, this is equal to the identity operator plus i divided by h bar delta tau h hat divided by h bar acting on psi of t. Now what is this? This is the unitary operator corresponding to an infinitesimal displacement in time. Okay. So the operator corresponding to the infinitesimal displacement delta tau in time of the physical system can be written as u hat of delta tau with the subscript h is equal to the identity operator plus i divided by h bar delta tau h hat. The h appearing here in the subscript stands for the fact that Hamiltonian is the generator of time translations. 
the finite time evolution operator can be constructed by compounding a large number of successive infinitesimal time translations. We had uh hat of delta tau, the infinitesimal translation operator in time. This was the identity operator plus i divided by h bar delta tau h hat. Okay. Now, if you apply infinite number of such uh, infinitesimal unitary transformations, you will get a finite unitary transformation. So the finite unitary transformation corresponding to a time tau can be written as limit n tend to, tends to infinity because you are taking a large number of infinitesimal time translations and the unitary operator corresponding to the infinitesimal time translation applied n times. Okay? This would give the finite time translation operator. Now, what we have in here is the infinitesimal time translation operator, which we write as the identity operator plus i divided by h bar. Delta tau here is tau divided by n. All right, it's the interval tau divided up into uh, infinitesimal pieces, delta tau. All right, and we also have the h hat here. Okay, so this tau divided by n here is actually delta tau. The in, it's an infinitesimal amount of time. Now, we can use the relation limit n tends to infinity 1 plus x divided by n whole raised to the power of n this is simply the exponential of x all right so this is the exponential of i divided by h bar i divided by h bar to h hat okay so we now have the unitary operator corresponding to finite displacement in time which is u hat h of tau is equal to exponential i divided by h bar tau h hat okay now if you remember the time evolution operator from before we see that there's a minus sign missing here the time evolution operator we had was exponential minus i divided by h bar tau h hat if you remember it from our second chapter on quantum dynamics the reason is that the time evolution operator corresponded to a change tau in the time coordinate all right here we are talking about a change tau in the physical system we are translating the system by an amount tau all right so this was the passive viewpoint and this is the active viewpoint here we are translating the system by an amount tau in time so a displacement delta tau in time of the physical system corresponds to a displacement minus delta tau for the time coordinate all right that is shifting the system in time by an amount delta tau is equivalent to shifting the coordinate system by an amount minus delta tau as we have already seen when we discussed active and the passive viewpoints of uh, transformations so that's the reason why we don't have a minus sign in here again as before the invariance of the hamiltonian under time translations requires that the unitary operator corresponding to time translations commutes with the hamiltonian so if the time translation is a symmetry of the system, then the Hamiltonian has to commute with the unitary operator corresponding to the time translation. We can also describe it like this. Okay? Time translation would be a symmetry of the system if the, if the translated system and the untranslated system obey the same equation. All right. So if psi prime of t and psi of t have to obey the same equation, again, we must have the unitary operator corresponding time translations commuting with the Hamiltonian. Okay, we have already seen this when we discussed space translation symmetries. Sorry, space translation symmetry. So for this to be a uh, for this to be a symmetry transformation, the Hamiltonian has to commute with the unitary operator corresponding to the transformation. Now h hat commutes with u hat h, provided the Hamiltonian here is independent of time. Hamiltonian is the operator corresponding to the energy of the system. All right. So the time independence of the Hamiltonian means that the total energy of the physical system is conserved. Now, this is in the Heisenberg picture, right? It's in the Heisenberg picture that we can say that when the Hamiltonian is independent of time, the total energy is conserved. All right. So when if the Hamiltonian is independent of time in the Heisenberg picture, then the expectation value of the Hamiltonian is also independent of time in the Heisenberg picture. All right, but the expectation value is the same in the Heisenberg picture and the Schrodinger picture. So when we say that energy is conserved, what we mean actually is that the expectation value of the Hamiltonian remains the same. 
Now, when the Hamiltonian depends on time, that is when the energy is not conserved, in that case, the unitary operator u hat does not commute with the Hamiltonian. In that case, the corresponding unitary operator is not given by exponential i by h bar tau h hat. Right? The unitary operator, if the Hamiltonian depends on time, is a more complicated expression. Right? I think we have talked about the Dyson series and all that. So when Hamiltonian depends on time, that means that the Hamiltonian will change in time, which in turn means that the transformation operator, the unitary operator corresponding to time transformation, cannot commute with the Hamiltonian. Because if it's commuted the Hamiltonian, then the Hamiltonian wouldn't change. So as a result, the Hamiltonian would not be invariant under a translation in time if the Hamiltonian depends on time. Okay, we, we thus see that the total energy of the system is conserved if the system is invariant under translations in time and vice versa. Okay? Again, we see the connection between a conservation law and a symmetry. The symmetry here is the time translation symmetry, all right, or the invariance of the Hamiltonian under time translations. The conservation law here is the conservation of energy. So conservation of energy follows from the underlying symmetry the symmetry called the invariance in time translations, all right, or the homogeneity of time. So the conservation of energy follows from the fact that time is homogeneous. Let's now move on to the symmetry under rotations in space and the corresponding conserved quantity, which is angular momentum. Now we have already discussed the relationship of rotations to the angular momentum of the physical system. So without going into too many details, we can directly guess the form of the unitary operator for rotations. Because in both translations and time evolutions, the appropriate infinitesimal operator has this form, the identity operator minus i g hat epsilon, where g is a Hermitian operator and epsilon is a real parameter. Okay? For translations, the generator was the linear momentum, and for time translations, the generator g was the Hamiltonian. Okay? We know from classical mechanics that angular momentum is the generator of rotations. Okay, So just like linear momentum is the generator of space translations and Hamiltonian is the generator of time translations, angular momentum is the generator of rotations. So we can write, we can guess the form of the infinitesimal rotation operator corresponding to a rotation of the physical system in the active viewpoint that is. All right, and if you are rotating it by an angle and about an axis, n hat. Okay, so the we can say that the the generator of rotations around an axis n hat is the component of the total angular momentum in that direction. All right, so the generator of the rotations about an axis n hat is the component of the angular momentum along that direction. Okay, so we can write u hat of n hat comma theta. All right, so this is the axis of rotation and this is the parameter. This can be written as exponential minus i by h bar theta n hat dot j hat. Again, remember that j hat is actually the total angular momentum of the system. That in includes the orbital angular momentum and the spin. Okay, for example, if you want to rotate the system about the z direction, okay, the corresponding unitary operator can be written as exponential minus i by h bar theta and the z component of the angular momentum. If the rotation is about the z direction, then the generator is the z component of the total angular momentum. We can write this as u hat of z comma theta. So now we have the unitary operator corresponding to rotations. The rest of the arguments are exactly the same. If the system has a rotational symmetry, that means that the Hamiltonian has to be invariant under rotations. And the Hamiltonian is invariant under rotations if the unitary operator corresponding to the rotation commutes with the Hamiltonian. Now, this unitary operator commutes with the Hamiltonian if the generator of this unitary transformation commutes with the Hamiltonian. That is, if the commutator of J with H is equal to zero. And if the commutator of J with H is equal to zero, then the total angular momentum is a conserved quantity. So we get conservation of angular momentum from the invariance under rotations. Okay, so we can say that conservation of angular momentum is a consequence of the rotational invariance of the system. So angular momentum is conserved because space is isotropic. 
because space has the same property in all directions. Okay. We have been discussing the fundamental relation between conservation laws and symmetries. In the last class, we saw that conservation of momentum is related to symmetry called homogeneity of space. All right, homogeneity of space. This means that space has the same property everywhere. Or we call this as translational invariance. And today we saw that conservation of energy, right? This is related to a symmetry that we called homogeneity of time. It follows from the fact that time is homogeneous, right? Homogeneity of time. And conservation of angular momentum, we also saw that conservation of angular momentum is related to symmetry, rotational invariance, or, or we call this as the isotropy of space. The fact that space has the same property in all directions, isotropy of space. Okay, we have already discussed these relations in classical mechanics also. These results are specific examples of what we call the Nether's theorem. Nether's theorem. It is one of the most beautiful and uh, most fundamental results that is used in physics. Most of the development of modern physics is actually based on this particular result called Nether's theorem. Okay, so with that I shall conclude this session. Thank you.